All right. Well, starting off this hour, a new report by the Washington Post is shining a light on the U.S. drone program in North Africa. Under a cloud of secrecy, the U.S. military and the CIA are expanding one base in particular. Right here. This is Camp Lemonnier, a 500-acre U.S. military base in the capital of the impoverished former uh, French colony, Djibouti. It started off as a temporary staging area for Marines trying to get a foothold on the volatile region back in 2002, but has quickly become a major asset in the U.S. counterterrorism operations abroad. And, as you can see, this camp's location is part of its lure. Djibouti shares a sea border with Yemen and a land border with Somalia. Now, just to quickly go over some of the numbers for you, 3,200 U.S. troops, contractors, and civilians work there. 300 of them are dedicated solely to the drone program. The U.S. pays Djibouti $38 million a year to lease the camp and is in the midst of a $1.4 billion expansion. And this country certainly isn't the only one seeing an un influx of unmanned aircrafts in its skies. For more on this changing face of war, I'm joined by Scott Horton, contributing editor at Harper's Magazine. Hi there, Scott. Let's start, uh, first of all, by talking about the strategic importance of Djibouti and what differences um, there are between the people that are operating drones sitting in Camp Lemonnier versus the ones that are in the air-conditioned bases in Nevada or Virginia. Uh, well, I think you did a very good job in the lead-in of uh, presenting the strategic element here. So, uh, in fact, if you look at a recent briefing that's been provided by senior figures in the intelligence community, we see something of a pivot going on uh, away from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan to, to uh, North Africa broadly as an area of concern an arc that runs from Mali all the way across the Sahara Sahel region and winds up uh, in the Horn of Africa in Somali. These are areas of uh, focused attention. And of course, just across the Red Sea there in that narrow strait is Yemen, uh, which may be, uh, uh, may be emerging after Pakistan as the next major focal uh, area for drone activities. Uh, and, uh, and we know that the drones, in fact, are operated uh, from uh, facilities, largely from facilities uh, back in the United States. In fact, there's an Air Force base in uh, Nevada where a lot of this is going on. At Langley, we see a lot of direction. Uh, but you have to maintain and operate them locally. So that's the reason for the bases and the contractors and the uniformed professionals on the ground there in Djibouti uh, who will do this maintenance and guidance action. May, they may also uh, step in and handle operation of the drones at some time at some points too. And Scott, I know that the military installation here in Djibouti is the only one of its kind. Um, is this just the first of many to come or is this a place that the military could get away with in a country because it is so small, so impoverished that many times Djibouti flies under the radar, so to speak? Well, I think it's, it's clear the United States is in uh, talks with several different countries uh, with respect to uh, siting some of these installations. Uh, Djibouti is one that surfaced. Uh, there are actually several island nations in the Indian Ocean uh, that have, in fact, housed uh, drone operations and have been in discussions with the United States for longer-term drone operations. And we've seen uh, signals or, or hints that something like this may be going on in several other African countries as well. So uh, they'll need that. Uh, that sort of infra infrastructure of support, and they're building it. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, it, this raises the normal spectrum of uh, base siding issues with a host nation. So usually having a foreign military force on your soil is not a popular thing. It's, in fact, there usually is a political, strong political opposition to it. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, Djibouti here, uh, you know, I mean, that's almost Djibouti's raison d'etre. It's, it's been a host for foreign forces for a long, long time. The French have been there for more than a century. Uh, and this is... Uh, 
the backbone of the economy of Djibouti, in fact, these military forces. And the U.S. is usually prepared to pay serious money uh, to have this support and to have the base leases. And there are a lot of countries, particularly in this part of the world, uh, that are eager to have that money. And uh, $38 million a year to lease that land is uh, quite a bit of money for an impoverished nation. But, Scott, one of the major criticisms of the drone program is the malfunctions and the crashes. I mean, there are no pilot crews in these aircrafts, meaning no American lives are in danger. And these planes do cost one-fifth of the price of an F-15, uh, so replacing them isn't all that expensive if they do crash. But, I mean, on the other hand, there have been numerous crashes, some um, providing potential intelligence to enemies and some endangering civilians. And what's more important is that there are reports of technical malfunctions of these machines. I mean, in uh, March of 2011, for instance, there is a documented instance of a Predator drone starting its engine by itself, through, uh, although the ignition was off and the fuel line was closed. So, I mean, this technology is far from perfect, right? Uh, that's right. I mean, it's a technology that's being developed over time, but even sophisticated technologies misfunction. And, of course, these are being guided remotely. Uh, and one of the big concerns about drones is that if you can guide it remotely, so can someone else. Uh, another power may be able to tap in and manipulate uh, your drone and, and seize control of it. So, you know, that's an issue. But I, I'd say the bigger issue is not so much for this part of the world. I mean, North Africa, the Arab Sea, we don't have an awful lot of air traffic there. But now let's imagine 20 or 30,000 drones operating in the United States or over Western Europe, areas that are uh, extremely congested with air traffic. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't have the resources right now to track or monitor them. The risk of uh, collisions and damage resulting from collisions would be uh, astronomically larger over these highly populated areas, especially North America and Western Europe. We, of course, should mention that all of this information, this newest information, is coming out in a three-part series in the Washington Post. Now, we also know that the United Nations is getting ready to start investigating the use of drones by the U.S. in the Middle East. I mean, they're asking the U.S. to, quote, clarify the procedures in place to ensure that any target killing complies with international humanitarian laws and humanitarian rights and indicate the measures or strategies applied to prevent casualties, as well as the measures in place to provide prompt, thorough, effective, and independent public investigations of the alleged violations. Now, the UN Special Rapporteur, Ben Emerson, did uh, go on to say that if the relevant states are not willing to establish the effective independent monitoring mechanisms, then the UN may have to finally resort um, and to take the last resort for the UN might be that it needs to take action. But I mean, Scott, can we really expect anything out of the UN at this point? Well, it is their responsibility. I mean, I think this is one area where the UN is acting entirely within their competence. You know, what's going on here essentially is we're seeing a new form of, war well, of warfare develop. Uh, and there are very serious questions as to how this checks against existing standards of international humanitarian law and the law of war itself. Uh, and the U.S.'s own position about this has been extremely ambiguous. I mean, there have been a couple of important speeches given by officials of the Obama administration where they've set out some guidelines. So they've also left an enormous number of questions unanswered. I and mean, Scott, we're going to have to leave it there. I really appreciate your time, sir. Uh, the fact is that there's a lot of things that we do know about this drone program and a lot more things that we don't know about this drone program. Scott Horton, contributing editor at Harper's Magazine, thank you for your time. Great to be with you.